Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me once again today, and welcome to Basic Nation Analysis Late Age Pythium. This is actually another commission video. Uh, Perun, one of my best supporters here, asked me to do this video, I think because he thought it would be funny, <laughs> to be honest. Um, because, I mean, and I can't really blame him, because Late Age Pythium is kind of a funny nation. Um, Late Age Pythium is... Well, as Late Age Pythium, you find yourself in a very interesting situation. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Let me get this out of the way up front. Late Age Pythium is a weak nation. Um, it's not the weakest nation around. Uh, there are a few that are worse. Uh, but the main distinction between Pythium, Late Age Pythium that is, not Middle Age Pythium. Middle Age Pythium is extremely strong. But Late Age Pythium is saved from the bottom ranks of nation, the bottom of the barrel, only because it can expand like hell if you're good with it. Um, I'm not very good with Late Age Pythium, actually, I have not practiced very much, but as you can see here, it's turn 12, and I have, I think, 17 provinces. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. And this is using fairly conservative expansion strategies. Um, and the reason is, so Pythium, unlike most bad nations, Pythium actually has quite good troops, which is, most bad nations have mediocre or bad troops. Um, and... The reason Pythium is a bad nation is because its mage core is overall so dog shit that it, that it compensates for the fact that its troops are quite good. So, 12, 12 turns, 17 provinces, I have one fort done that I was going to upgrade this turn, and I have two more under construction, one done in two turns, and one done- both done in two turns actually, I double forted uh, just a little bit ago. I have the money and space to start a fourth extra fort this turn, so by the middle of year one, I'll have five forts. Um, as Pythium, my upkeep is very low, my income is actually reasonably okay, uh, my treasury is very large. Overall, things are going okay for Pythium right now. The problems don't really start until a little bit later. So, first of all, let's talk about those units, since I was mentioning them first. Um, Pythium's unit lineup is actually very good, um, and there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, they have gladiators. I haven't talked about gladiators much in basic nation analyses, I don't think. Because I haven't done many of the Roman nations. I think I did Early Age or more, if I recall correctly. But in any case, Retarius and Gladiator. Retarii were actually a type of Gladiator, but in any case. Um, they're extremely cheap. They're fast to recruit. They only cost one resource and ten gold. Um, they're very effective units. So, for example, standard Gladiators here have 11 attack skill, which translates to 12 with a flail. And their flail has two attacks. So they do a bunch of damage and they hit twice. Um, overall for 10 gold and 1 resource, fantastic deal. Same with the Retarius over here, 10 gold, 1 resource, they have a net which webs people, they have excellent stats, and they have a trident which does a crap ton of piercing damage. So the thing about Retarii and Gladiators, the reason they are so cheap, is because they vanish after one battle. They will only fight until they have been wounded or hit someone in battle before leaving. So if they fight anyone at all, they vanish at the end of the battle. They're effectively, you've lost them if they ever have to fight. So that's very interesting because effectively what that means is Pythium, as well as Early Age Armor and Middle Age Pythium and, and the other Roman nations, I think all the Roman nations except, of course, Middle Age Armor have access to these guys. Um, effectively, it means you can recruit mercenaries just for money without having to bid for them. You pay 10 gold per dude and you get what's basically a mercenary who will hang around for a turn or a few turns and fight a battle and then vanish in the way that mercenaries do. Um, that's actually really, really useful because it means that you can basically churn out, you can churn out literally 40 of these suckers turn one if you want to, and use them to bolster your initial expansion army to take four or five provinces without stopping very, very easily. It takes a little bit of scripting chops, and as I have mentioned, my battle scripting is actually pretty bad. Um, or it's not, okay, it, it's not bad, it's okay, it's serviceable, but I don't have the, the feel for it and the knowledge for it that a lot of the older players who have been playing since Dominions 3, say, do. Um, if you've been playing steadily since Dominions 2 or Dominions 3, you know a lot more about how the scripting system works and interacts with the units and the various unit speeds and etc. than I do. And if you're good at that, you can win a lot of battles with very, very minimal casualties. You'll take a province and you'll lose like four gladiators. Um, who will vanish at the end of the battle, effectively, and, and nothing else. The other part of the puzzle, the reason why the gladiators work so well, is the Comita Tense. Um, the Comita Tense is an exceptionally high-quality infantry unit, and you may not see it from the stats at first, but let's talk about it. 15 gold, 26 resources, 21 recruitment points, so expensive for an infantry unit. This is an expensive unit. Um, 
15 protection, which is higher than average for infantry, even at a late age. Or about average for infantry, maybe a little bit above. Defense skill 16, which is significantly above average for even late age, for late age infantry, or any infantry, really. And a lot of it comes from having a tower shield. The tower shield has, has a parry value of 7. So effectively, the tower shield is providing essentially 5 points of defense, because it's a defense penalty, but then has a parry. Um... And for if the combat defense rolls above a 9, it will be hit, technically speaking, but it will effectively have 30 protection. So, like, humans are not going to punch through that. On top of that, the combat defense has just above average strength and attack skill. It has a broadsword, which does quite good damage with a high attack value, and it has javelins. So you can throw these javelins before you get into combat. Javelins are a really good quality for an infantry unit to have. The other thing that Comet Tenses have that makes them exceptionally good value is Map Move 16. And the reason why that's exceptionally good value is because 16 is exactly the amount that you need to be able to run across two planes, even if they're snowy. So even if it's cold, even if it's winter, an army of Comet Tenses, and only Comet Tenses, can cross two planes provinces in one turn, which means they can hit provinces you know, enemy provinces that are out in, in this circle. Like this, that, this, that, um, this province. All these provinces can be hit from Pythium's capital in one turn by armies of Comitatenses. Uh, so that makes them extremely valuable because they have that higher mobility than is usual. You also have Palatines. Palatines are actually better than Comitatenses in stats, but unfortunately, they lose a couple points of map move, so they can't necessarily do the same things. Especially if, if one of the provinces is snowy, Palatines can't cross two provinces anymore. And they lose the Javelin attack. So, that's a problem. However, their protection is two points higher, and their defense skill is only one point... Uh, th I'm sorry, three points higher. And their defense is only one point lower. So in terms of chaffing, Palatines are even better. Um, the issue just is that they can't, uh, they can't accomplish the same thing that Comitatenses do. Uh, even Pythium's lower quality infantry or lower grade infantry are actually still pretty solid. Um, they have the, the Milite. Milite are militia, and they're really good as far as militia go. They have defense skill 14, and they have javelins. You can expand with Milites, just without a whole lot of trouble. They will die. Their morale is quite low, but as Pythium, you also have access to good leaders, and we'll talk about those in a second. Uh, the Limitani is your basic, like, frontier unit. Um, the cool thing about units like the Limitani is that they can actually be recruited in non-fort provinces. Uh, now, their resources are the biggest cap on that. Resources place a huge crimp on Limitani production, but you can still recruit them, and they're still decent middle-of-the-road infantry with javelins and a castle defense bonus. So they count for a full point of siege defense each. So you can stack these guys in your forts, and it's pretty effective. Um, their morale is a little bit lower than average. But 15 prop, 14 defense skill plus a javelin... Very, very high quality chaff. Uh, Limitani Pramanis, or Primanis, are uh, a heavier version. They wear the heavy armor, like the uh, the Palatines do. Um, unfortunately, that actually drops their defense skill by a point, and um, once again, they lose the Javelin. So, overall, wouldn't really recruit them a lot, but uh, Comitatents and Limitanis and Milites, all very good quality for the price. You also have access to standards. So, you have Limitani standards which give a plus one morale bonus. And then you have the standard standard, which costs 10 gold more for better stats. Um, overall, I would just use Limitani standards, I think, because there's no reason to spend the extra money. And um, yeah, it's just 10 more gold for not a whole lot. Extra point of defense, two extra points of morale, point of attack skill. If your tower is routing from taking morale checks, then you're, if you're, I'm sorry, if you're standard, is routing from taking morale checks, and you're probably already doomed, so I would just stick with the Limitani standard. Uh, but overall, for your basic infantry troops, this is an incredibly solid lineup. Like, this is really high quality. Um, it's probably not the best lineup in the game. I think the best infantry in the game is still Middle Age Ulm, but it's up there. Uh, Pythium's infantry is very, very strong, and it can expand very, very well. You can see here, right over here in the Eternal Expanse, I took on 29 Barbarians with a total of 3 casualties, 2 Comita Tenses, and then in Griffin Rock, uh, this was just Wolf Tribe, and I just buzzsawed through the Wolf Tribe with no problem whatsoever. Last turn, I took on a bunch of Heavy Cavalry here, or, I'm sorry, turn before last, I took on a bunch of Heavy Cavalry here, beat them with no casualties, um, 
over here I took on, that was Lion Tribe, this was Heavy Infantry and Crossbows. Uh, the Crossbows caused me, I think, four casualties, but I, I still chopped through them, no real problem. Um, my expansion has actually been hampered by the fact that on three separate occasions, I have had my commander hit by a random arrow and rout, and that takes the expansion party with it, of course, so that was unlucky. I could easily have had, like, 20 provinces. Uh, and that would not be out of the ordinary for Late Age Pythium expansions, I think. So Late Age Pythium can set itself up in a position in the early game where it has a lot of territory, where it has a lot of resources, a lot of income, where it's doing fine moving into kind of the early mid game. Uh, in terms of commanders, your basic Centurion commander has 80 leadership, so he can use formations and gives a morale bonus. Um, you have the Tribuni, or Tribuni, who are inspirational, so they give a plus two morale bonus and move quickly um, and then you have the magister's militum who have 120 leadership plus the plus two morale bonus and even though they're old they still move fast enough to keep up with the comita tenses so your base commanders are great um your troops are great it all seems really good so far right well let's talk about mages let's let's just talk about mages for a second you have a battle deacon battle deacon is a basic commander who is priest level one and poison resistant and that Eh, that seems like it should be important, although it really isn't all that much. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. You have the Serpent Acolyte. The Serpent Acolyte is a basic bitch, a Nature 1, Holy 1 Priest, 70 gold, 7 research points, fine. This is an okay mage. Nothing exceptional, but fine. Then you have the Renata. The Renata is 125 gold for a Sacred but not Priest, Water 1, and then has one random. This is Pythium's random selection. Water, Astral, Death, and Nature. Um, the Renata is not a very good mage, overall. Um, Renatas are a lot like Masters of the Way from Tianqi. Uh, and they're not, they're just not amazing. I mean, you can communion them if they random Astral. If they random Death, they're not super useful. If they random Nature, you could potentially boost them up to cast Foul Vapors. But you have better mages for that, and it would be a lot of work. If they random water, then they're just a water 2 mage, which for 125 gold, a water 2 is okay, but not exceptional, especially with no other special qualities. Uh, for comparison, the what I would consider kind of the, the standard of, S, of X2 mages, you know, mages with two of the same path, like uh, Rephite Sages or Trophimos Sages. Trophimos Sages are a great example. They're 115 for a linked random, which is much more valuable than one path plus one random, and they get 11 research points instead of nine. So Renatas really kind of fall short by that standard. Um, you have Renatus. The Renatus is a much better mage because he starts with death. Same randoms, but he can get death two or he can get death astral. Those are both really good cross paths. Um, death nature and death water, eh, once again, not super exceptional. Um, but the Renatus is a much better mage than the Renata, in my opinion, generally speaking. Then you have the Theurg. The Theurg is another cheap mage. Um, he's Astral 1, Holy 1 with a random from Air, Water, and Astral, which doesn't seem bad. This is not bad for the price. Um, but he's capital only. He only comes from the Cathedral, the Temple of the Spheres. Um, so you can't actually mass them up, which means you can't have a lot of efficient communions out of Theurgs, which is a real shame. And then you have Serpent Priests. Serpent Priests are your capital-only mage, um, and they're, once again, they're just not impressive. Um, Serpent Priests are one that I would call actually overpriced. Uh, 265 gold, capital-only. They're not slow to recruit, fortunately, but they start off with one water, two nature, and then they have 100% random and a 10% random from this same setup. And I... Mm, mm, I don't know about that. Uh, as Pythium, you do tend to have a lot of money, so yeah, you can afford them, but they're just not very strong. They're just not very good at stuff. I mean, they can cast Foul Vapors. They're good at casting Foul Vapors. Um, they can potentially Communion. If you random the death on them, you can do Death Nature stuff, like Forge Manic, like Summon Mannequins, or... Uh, that's about all I'm I'm getting. That's about all I'm thinking of. You can summon Lamias with them. You can get... Uh, if you boost their water, you can get... Um, 
You could summon the Kidneys, Nyad Warriors. You could summon Nyads with them. So there's things they can do, but they're not the highest value of things, and it's kind of a little bit of an expensive mage for this, for having to need so many boosters to do this stuff. That's Pythium's in-fort mage lineup, and it's just really mediocre. Like, Serpent Acolytes are fine. For their price, yeah, sure. They're not super useful, but they're fine for, like, essentially research chaff and spamming out swarm and stuff like that. Um, Renatas are bad. Renatas are not very good. Uh, the best possible thing they can do is random astral and be communion bitches, which, okay, communion slaves, whatever. They're, they're not great. Renatusas, eh, they're okay. They're better because they have the, the guaranteed death. For the value, for the price, okay, fine. Death too, potentially. If they random water or nature, then you're just like, well, okay, fine. That's a guy who's not super useful, I guess. Overall, just uninspiring. Not bad, but uninspiring. The Ergs, same uninspiring. Um, you need a lot of them to accomplish much. They can't do much on their own. And then Serpent Priests, a little bit overpriced. Once again, not great. Um, really don't, really just kind of leave you looking at this lineup going, eh, well, so what? So what do I do with all this? Um, in terms of other commanders, you have Serpent Assassins, who would be actually really good if they weren't capital only, and thus competing with both Theurgs and Serpent Priests for your cap only slots. Um, Unlike most assassins who are armed with basic poisoned weaponry, serpent assassins are armed with serpent chrises, which do death poison and have a lot of armor piercing damage. So if they scratch somebody with this 15 pierce, which is very likely, um, they will inflict 35 poison damage, which will kill most humans just outright. They can scale walls, they're assassin too, they have a huge patrol bonus, they have pretty high stealth, they're very poison resistant. Serpent assassins are good. They're just, they're capital only and they compete for capital-only recruitment slots with mages. Mages that are fairly important to you despite not being super powerful. And then you have Serpent Lords, which are the uh, the leader version of your sacred. They, once again, not priests, just sacred. So given that, I don't know why you'd ever use them. Um, they have leadership 40. They're blessable, but they can't bless. So you can't use them to lead sacred expansion parties. And if you want to lead armies, you have much, 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 much better options that cost comparable or less. So, I would never really use Super Servant Lords. Uh, to finish out the forts before we go on, in terms of units that I haven't talked about yet, you do have three Sacreds. Um, they're all capital only, um, which is a little bit sad, because some of them are... De like, the Serpent Cataphracts are decent. For the price, they're fine. 18 protection, 15 defense skill, 12 attack, 12 strength, uh, 2 attacks, including a light lance with a charge bonus. The poisonous bite isn't super impressive. Um, for some reason, it has an extra sucky poison, because most poisons just take effect. But this poison, for some reason, is negatable by, ma by magic resistance, and it's only fatigue damage, and it's reduced for large targets. So it's like... It's like early age Machaka's spirit clubs that they have on their lion warriors, but in addition, it's negatable by magic resistance. And so it's not actual poison, which is hilarious um, and sad. But, I mean, the poison bite is a second attack, sure. So it has two attacks. Uh, good defense skill, good protection. It's cavalry, so the defense skill is hard to wear down. Serpent cataphracts are fine, and you could take a bless for serpent cataphracts and do fine. Your other two sacreds, much less fine. You have Hydra Hatchlings, and then you have full-size Hydras. Now here's the thing. Hydras cost 270 gold. I think they're the most expensive recruitable unit in the game. Recruitable troop, that is, not commander. Um, they're more expensive than least Dragonians. And basically, basically a Hydra is a somewhat worse or comparable water elemental. And what I mean by that is, a Hydra is a multi-attack, high HP uh, unit that has the shrinking mechanism that, uh, that water elementals do, except it doesn't actually regenerate its HP when it shrinks. It's just that as Hydras take more and more damage, they lose heads, and so their, numbers of attack their number of attacks goes down. This isn't helpful. Um, it means that if a Hydra starts to lose, it will then continue to lose harder and harder until it dies. 
Um, they do regenerate, which is nice. Uh, they have fear, they're blunt and pierce resistant, however they are susceptible to fire by a lot. Uh, they're cold blooded, so if they're fighting in the cold they wear out really really quick. Um, and they have a poison cloud. Now poison cloud is very effective, so this is nice, like poison clouds will kill people who are not prepared for them very easily. The downside is, not prepared for them includes your troops. Pythium's units are not basically poison resistant. Some of them are. Uh, battle Deacons, where is the Battle Deacon? Battle Deacons are slightly poison resistant. This will not save them from being murdered by their own Hydra, by the way. The, um, the poison aura rolls enough times that it can absolutely punch through five poison resistance like that. Um, but Battle Deacons, poison resistant. Serpent Acolytes, slightly poison resistant. Um, Serpent Cataphracts, funnily enough, are not. Uh, but Serpent Priests are quite poison resistant. So Serpent Priests are, like, completely safe. Everything else isn't. So what that means is it's really hard for you to use Hydras in armies as Late Age Pythium because they'll kill all your guys. <laughs> they'll, they'll literally poison... It, they're like living Mercuries. They have the same problem. If they end up in the middle of your own troops, they will kill them. And in order to stop that, you have to do a bunch of research and spend gems to get the, the higher level poison resistance spells, which you really don't want to do because you want to be using those nature gems on other things. Also... Hydras are undisciplined, which means they're really hard to actually bless effectively if you have more than one. Um, the lesser head attacks are not super impactful, the great head attack is pretty decent. But overall, for 270 gold, what you're buying is a big sack of HP with limited protection that regenerates not enough because it's going to be being attacked by at least three and probably six or nine enemy units at a time. Uh, and that kills off your own guys and doesn't inflict a huge amount of damage. So Hydras are bad. Like that's, at least that's my opinion. Like if you have a different opinion, by all means, put it in the comments below. Tell me about all the success you've had with Hydras as late age Pythium. I've tried them in a couple different ways. I, I can't see it. I don't see it. Unless you in, invest in a huge hellish bless for your Hydras, in which case they can work, but you've crippled your nation because Everything else you want is really exp is pretty expensive. Like value, yes, but expense at the same time, particularly resources. Um, Hydra hatchlings are hydras, but very small. So they're still bad. They're just smaller. Um, they have all the same problems, except they regenerate less and they have fewer attacks, and they don't do as much poison damage. So I guess if you're really worried about the poison damage, you could use hydra hatchlings instead of full size hydras to try and avoid killing your own troops, but they're not going to kill your own troops because they will die. Uh, because they have fucking four protection. So, overall, I would just not use Hydras. Ever. Um, unless Poison was the only way I could see to win, and even then I would just cast Foul Vapors instead of using Hydras. Um, but fortunately, you can just ignore Hydras, straight up, and use your good troops to win battles, because they'll do that very effectively. Um, Including Serpent Cataphracts. Serpent Cataphracts, like I said, they're fine. They're not super inspiring as Sacreds go. They don't have the qualities that make Sacreds notable, like being Recruit Anywhere, or being cheap, or having three attacks, or... Uh, but they're perfectly solid, like, Heavy Cavalry Plus. That's what they are, and you can slap a Bless on them, and they will do you proud. Hydras, not so much. So, that's Pythium's Forts. But what's really interesting about Pythium, and what I wish was more interesting and more effective, is what they can do outside of forts. If you go to a province that's not forted in Pythium, you may notice you have a whole mage lineup here. And this is really cool, and I really like it, and I would like it a lot more if these mages didn't suck. You start off with the Leo. The Leo is 80 gold, only one recruitment point. Um, he's a Fire 1 wizard with a 10% chance of also being Nature 1. Um, he is a good leader, which is nice. Um, he has Firepower, he's an inept researcher, so you can't just spam these guys out to do research. And he's a heretic. This, on honestly, being a heretic isn't usually a problem, because you can manage it. Um, and by, by sort of deliberately stripping your dominion away from certain locations you can kind of kind of keep it all under control and sort of try to gain the benefit of other people's dominions instead of your own 
But for Pythium, I think Heretic is kind of a problem because Pythium really, really wants to take a bunch of scales. Uh, because you have all these expensive troops, because you have lots and lots of cheap mages, you really, in my opinion, want to take a lot of scales. And being a heretic means that your good scales will not help you as much as they could. Also, a fire one mage for 80 gold is a bad deal. There's no reason to pay 80 gold for one path of fire. Uh, now, you can view the Leo as paying 80 gold for a good commander who also happens to be a Fire 1 mage, and that's fine, but you could also just pay 70 gold for a Centurion and ignore the fire magic, so... and not have to deal with the whole heresy thing. So, eh, I, I wouldn't say Leos are fantastic, to be honest. Um, then you have Heliodromi, Heliodromuses. They cost two recruitment points. Uh, which means they take two turns to recruit because they can only be recruited outside of forts. They have 100% fire or nature. Um, so effectively, what you're getting is either a slow to recruit fire 2 mage or a slow to recruit fire nature mage. Um, they're once again cheap, but they're actually heretic too. So... Eh. 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 I wouldn't say he's super great either. Um, he does actually have a, a special national spell that is unique to Heliodromai, which is, I think it's in Thaumaturgy if I were, yeah, the Torobolium. You have to be a nature and fire one, uh, Heliobolus. And it gives you path boosts and holy status. That's what it does. Which is kind of neat. Like, okay, six nature gems, that's cheap. Yeah, Heliodromai can use that to boost themselves up to be, like, actually kind of useful. Um, it's like the rich. It's like the blessing of the God Slayer spell that uh, that Polar Marches get, except Polar Marches gives him Bane of Heresy and doesn't give them a path boost. So you know what I mean. It's a cool spell. It's a nice little bit, nice little touch. Uh, and recruiting Heliodromuses outside of the capital is a perfectly valid thing to do for that reason. It's just they're hard to mass, and for a cheap mage, being hard to mass is an issue. Uh, Misties are. 40 gold, 1 recruitment point, nature 1 mages. They have 5 recruitment po 5 research points, actually, so you can churn Misties out to research, especially because they are not heretics, unlike the others. So this might be one of the most useful uses, especially early in the game, of your labs outside of forts. Just churn out a ton of Misties and add them to your research core, especially if you took magic scales. Um, I keep pulling out of that for no real reason. You then also have the Apoptes. The Apoptes are disease healers, which are useful. Um, they are heretics, and they take two turns to recruit. They can random nature and earth, um, and they are nature one. You don't get a whole lot of earth magic other than Apoptes, and they can only ever be nature earth one. So, not super useful, actually. Um, earth one mages can use gems to cast earth power, and then they can cast some basic earth two spells. So that's fine. That's something that you can do with Apoptes. Um... I'm sure I'm butchering that name, by the way. But so, okay, Epoptes, okay, Misties, all right. Revelers. Revelers are one of the most interesting, because Revelers have a chance to random blood. 10% of Revelers are blood one, which means that you can get into blood as late age Pythium. Uh, however, effectively what that means is, on average, you're going to end up paying 500 gold for each blood one mage. So, we're not talking about efficient <laughs> blood. We're not talking about fast blood. We're talking about eventually, a while down the road, you may end up with some blood from Revelers. Uh, more than somebody who has no recruitable blood whatsoever, but not by a whole lot. A uh, 10% chance of blood is actually the same as you get from Jaguar Tribe Indies. Uh, their mages also have a 10% chance to random blood. I don't think I've run across any Jaguar Tribe, but um, you'll just have to trust my math on that. And, uh, it's not great. But Revelers can do it. And if Revelers random blood, they end up nature one, blood one. And you actually do have a cool national spell you can cast to take advantage of that. That costs a very, very few slaves. So you can actually afford to do it with the very, very few slaves that you will get. Uh, unfortunately, Revel Revelers also cause unrest. Which will, of course, make blood hunting with them even worse than you're thinking it is right now. Um, and it will mean that they will, if you're patrolling to burn unrest down to zero at the end of the turn, um, revelers will cause you to chew through your population a lot more quickly. So, you've got these, these foreign mages, and to be honest, they're kind of shit. 
Um, they have uses. There are reasons for them. Heliodromi have uses. Apoptes have uses. Revelers definitely have uses. But in order to get the ones that you want, the good ones, you have to spend a lot of time and money. Uh, the decent ones, revelers are not slow to recruit because they're only one recruitment point, so that's fine. But Heliodromi take two turns to recruit. Epoptes take two turns to recruit. And recruiting these mages requires that you have undefended labs just sitting around in your territory with no fort on them, which means they can be easily burned down by raiding groups. And every time that happens, you not only lose whatever mage you were recruiting and the gold invested in them, you lose the lab and need to spend 500 gold to build it back up again. And the same thing can happen again. Um, your troops are too time-consuming to master whether you want to be just sitting around patrolling everywhere um your only patrol bonus commander is the serpent assassin which is capital only so as late age pythium i think and as always disclaimer i actually have not played late age pythium through a full dominions 5 multiplayer game i've messed around with them some i've theory crafted about them i've played them in single player i've examined the mages i've messed around in debug mode with the national spells and units and different unit combos and fights and all of that, but I have not taken them into a multiplayer game. So I could be wrong about this. But my impression is, if you get into a war with anybody as late age Pythium, the first thing they're going to do is start blowing up your your labs. And you're not, you're going to end up bleeding a lot of money and time and effort trying to deal with that, and it's going to cripple your production of foreign recruit mages. So overall, the best Pythium's Mage Core gets is mediocre. You don't have any good mages. You only have mages that ain't bad. And then, of course, you have mages that are bad. Um, and in particular, you don't have any mages that are strong. You don't have any mages that can individually do much, except Serpent Priests. Serpent Priests can be Nature 3, and that's the best you get. Now, recall, Middle Age Machaka, widely considered one of the worst nations in the game, and for good reason, gets Nature 3 all the time on a quarter of their Recruit Anywhere mages. Um, they get Death 2 and Fire and Earth and all this st on those same mages. Their capital only has, I think, two or three times this number, like twice the, it's twice this number of paths and isn't particularly much more expensive. In fact, I think black sorcerers are actually cheaper than this, but they're slow to recruit. So, you know, it evens out. That's fine. Um, but overall, Pythium's mages range from awful to unexceptional. And for the good ones to accomplish anything, they have to have a pretty significant communion behind them. A communion which will take a long time for you to muster, because Astral only comes as a 25% random to most of your mages, and your Astral Theurgs, the ones that are guaranteed to have Astral 1, don't have half of your paths. So if you use them as communion slaves, you're going to deal a lot of damage to that communion very, very quickly. So in the early game, Pythium does fine, because Pythium can expand very rapidly, Pythium has very efficient troops, Pythium can even prosecute an early war, potentially, on the backs of its comitatenses at Limitani and Milites. The problem comes once you hit about, I would say, turn 24, turn 20, 24, as other people start to hit their research goals at around levels 4 or 5. Once mages come into the picture, Pythium drops like a rock, because those good troops they've got start to struggle once they have, like, difficulty getting buffs to compete with other, other people's actual battle magic. Now, one thing that you can do is you can use Limitani Solari, um, which you can recruit outside of forts. They're kind of a pain in the ass to gather up because of that. You can't recruit them in forts, incidentally. If you build a fort, it disables the ability to recruit Limitani Solaris. Um, but in non-fort provinces, you can mass slowly mass up Limitani Solari, um, which are decent units, perfectly fine, and they have fire resistance, and you can cast Bark Skin on them. Um, that's probably... Wooden Warriors is probably one of your earliest and most efficient buffs, uh, and that will kick their prot up to over 20 which makes them very, very tough, and then they can churn through a lot of enemy chaff without really having a huge problem. Their biggest problem will become encumbrance, because after 10 rounds of fighting, a Limitani Solari is at about 60 fatigue, 
uh, and is starting to take a lot of critical hits, and their effective protection is lowered by quite a bit, and their attack and defense skills are both lowered. So even though you won't see that change, that's how fatigue works, and it will kill you when you have high encumbrance troops like this. Especially like Pr Primani Solaris. If you look at the stats, they seem great, but they don't have the, the Javelin, and then they have Encumbrance 9. Not good. No bueno. Um, but yeah, your Chaff can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody else in the Age pretty effectively. The problem just is that you don't have a whole lot of backup. Um, there's not there's not a lot of vinegar in your Mage Core, as it were. So, <laughs> it's a little bit tough. Now, in order to work the, the early mid-game and the late mid-game effectively... I think as Pythium, you really have to focus on research priorities. And this is one reason why, as Pythium, I say you want a lot of scales. You need Production 3 to recruit your troops. You really, really want Growth 3, because everybody wants Growth 3 still. Even after the nerf, growth is, growth is probably the most important scale in most circumstances. And you also want Magic 3, because all of your mages are little, cheap human mages. You don't have any big ones. Um, the Serpent Priest is the biggest you get, and he's only got three paths. Well, four paths. So... In order to maximize the effectiveness of these little shitty human mages you've got, you want Magic 3 so that your Serpent Acolytes can be churning out 10 research points per turn, and your Renati can be turning out 12, and your Renatus can be turning out 12, and your Theurgs can be turning out 12. So anytime you're not out fighting with them, you can be researching up a hell of a lot of points pretty quickly for the price that you're paying, especially because many of your mages are sacred. Um, in fact, I think pretty much all of your mages are sacred as Pythium. Yep, I think every non every capital and fort mage that you have is sacred. Your non-fort mages are not. Your non-fort mages are, as I mentioned, heretics, uh, except for Misties. But that's okay. You can you can stack them in a ghetto somewhere where they don't where it doesn't matter if you lose all your dominion and just kind of have them be there while your Misties go back to a fort and start turning out the research with the plus three from your magic three scales. Forty gold for an eighty research mage that's a pretty good deal but what is that research getting for you is the question well there's a few answers the first is in conjuration uh you have one of your national spells contact lar contact lar is an amazing spell and actually i'm going to let's take a, a quick break here so that i can hop over to the dominion's mod inspector to show you what these spells do okay so here we are in the mod inspector and here are our national spells um Contact Lar. Contact Lar is an amazing spell. Um, it For some reason it has minus two precision, which is funny because it's not a combat spell. I don't know why this is there. But you spend 16 nature gems, you summon a Lar. A Lar is a really good mage. Lars are ethereal. They're sacred. They have spirit sight and recuperation. They're stealthy. They resist poison, which is can be valuable. Um, and they have nature two, earth one, water one. So Lars are really good. I mean, hell, it might be worthwhile to summon a Lar just for sight-searching purposes as Pythian, because he has more of your paths than any of your mages do, except for Serpent Priests. Um, Lars can be given a Thistle Mace to cast most of your important nature stuff in uh, on the battlefield. Uh, Lars can do a lot of cool forging for you. Lars are stealthy and ethereal, so they're actually thuggable if you really want to do that, although as Late Age Pythian, I probably wouldn't. Um, but they're just really solid summons for a really solid price. Like, it's worth investing a bunch of nature gems in summoning Lars, just because Lars are cool and useful. Um, they're good. They're very, very nice. Tarabolium, we talked about, gives a path boost, including Holy, to a Heliodromus. Pride of Lions is a chaff summon that I wouldn't really bother with, because your national troops are much better. Awaken Hamadryad is a really interesting spell that I don't think I've ever talked about before, um, even though a bunch of nations have it. Um, Hamadryad's would be really good, pretty valuable summons, except they're immobile and they have a research penalty, so you can't move them once you place them and they can't really do much. Um, you can't use it as a remote attack because you can't target it at another forest, but even with their downsides, Hamadryads are, I think, probably reasonably valuable. Like, you can, well, I want to like Hamadryads. Um, Hamadryads are very good defensively, so if you want to summon a Hamadryad in a fort that you anticipate being attacked shortly, or perhaps if you want to summon a Hamadryad in the way of an army that you anticipate attacking one of your unforted labs, that might be worthwhile, because Hamadryads are really hard to kill. I mean, they have 110 hit points, 18 protection, they are innate spellcasters, 
and they summon 3d6 Harpy Chaff at the start of the battle, so that can kind of derange enemy plans and prevent them from attacking you immediately while your Hamadryad la lands buffs on itself. Also, they have sort of a hilarious attack animation. Look at that thing. It's literally humping the tree. That's that's what it's doing. Yep, definitely. Okay, that's the, uh, in case you didn't notice, that's the Hamadryad. Stop attack spot. That's the Hamadryad right there, the little human figure on the side of the tree. Anyway, um... So yeah, Hamadryads can hold off attackers pretty well, they can spam a lot of Creeping Doom, they can cast uh, Howl, they can... I, they actually cannot cast Relief, unfortunately, because it requires Nature 5. But they can do a lot of stuff for you, especially because as innate spellcasters, of course, they'll keep casting every round. The downside just is, like I said, they're immobile. They're strictly defensive. You can't take them with your army. But overall, worth considering in certain circumstances, not all the time. Gift of the Sacred Swamp is a gemless version of Serpent's Blessing, so it gives poison resistance. Unfortunately, it only gives poison resistance to three squares, and only within a range of 15, so it's not actually very useful. Um, if you take a whole bunch of Serpent Acolytes to combat, they can all spam Gift of the Sacred Swamp and give your guys poison resistance. Uh, will it be enough to save them from Hydras if you bring Hydras? Maybe, if it's accurate. Uh, I think you're still going to take some casualties, and overall I wouldn't bother. Daughter of Typhon is a national summon, a very late game one. It's hard for you to cast, although you can get up to nature 5 without too much trouble. And you can get nature death cross paths on Serpent Priests, so you can pull it off. Um, it summons this, this lovely lady, the Daughter of Typhon. And this summon is worth 30 gems, I would say. It's just that it comes at Conjuration 9, and by the time it's Conjuration 9, uh, large monsters with honestly fairly mediocre stats and no slots aren't relevant anymore. So if we look at more info here we can see uh yeah two miscellaneous item slots you can't gear the daughter of Typhon effectively in order to be a super combatant which is what you would want to try to do with her. Um, she does regenerate at 10%, so that's 22 hit points around. If you slap a Ring of Regeneration on her, it's 44. But, eh, eh. With 13 protection and only 18 magic resistance, the usual counters will destroy her pretty quickly. She is immortal and sacred, but immortality still means she can be soul slain or enslaved. And, yeah. And, and Pythium's not really a blessed nation, so I'm not sure I would have a huge bless for her. Um, also, she's an animal, so she's vulnerable to certain nature spells that only affect animals. Uh, cool. Like, really cool. But probably not worth it. Now, what is really worth it, and what's probably Late Age Pythium's most worth it national spell, is Orgy, which is a spell that only they have access to. It summons for one slave, just one, it summons six Maenads and a Satyr. And a Satyr can summon one Maenad per turn. So, so, so as Late Age Pythium, if you recruit a bunch of your revelers and you manage to get just a couple of Blood One Nature Ones and Blood Hunt with them, so you can build up like 20 Blood Slaves or something, you can cast Orgy 20 times and then be churning out 20 Maenads per turn for free, which is kind of cool. Um, once again, it's not incredibly important to you because you already have really, really effective infantry, but it is sort of hilarious. Um because your satyrs can just be spawning free chaff for you. And honestly, I would probably just take the main ads and stack them in forts um, and use them as siege defense chaff. Uh, but yeah, if you ever get blood slaves or anything, just setting somebody to cast orgy on repeat is a perfectly valid way to use them. And then just, like I said, lock your satyrs up and summon tons and tons and tons and tons of main ads because why not? There's no reason not to. It adds to you, it bulks out your forces, it lets you have siege defense or siege offense, because you can also use them as siege chaff against enemy forts, without having to necessarily risk your, or or hold back your elite Roman infantry, which are, as I said, among the better infantry in the game. So, those are your national spells. Um, Lars are good, Hamadryads are situational, Orgy is good. The rest of them are pretty ignorable honestly, and not super, super important. Tarabolium could be useful. Um, being able to boost up a, a nature fire mage is pretty cool. But generally speaking, uh, it's just, just nature stuff and orgy, which is 
like I said, cool. It helps, but it's not going to swing a war. Um, be, just because of the turn investment involved. The price is definitely right. I mean, it's super cheap. The problem just is, every casting of this only gets you one satyr, and every satyr only gets you one main ad per turn. So, the time that it takes to build up to critical mass is huge. And always remember, Dominions 5 is a time-limited game. Turns are actually your rarest resource. So, in a game that rarely is going to go over maybe 70, 75, 80 turns, uh, every satyr that you generate is only going to spawn, you know, X main ads, where X is the number of turns between the time when you summon them and the time when the game ends. And in the process, of course, they're going to increase unrest, but who cares about that, really? So, you know, if you're summoning a satyr on turn 40, he's probably only going to get 20 or 30 main ads out at most, and the ones he spawns in those last few turns will probably never be used assuming that you live to the end of the game, which, of course, is an assumption in and of itself. In the mid-game, it's entirely possible to be wiped off the face of the Earth in about 10 turns. So, you know, it's just too slow to be game-changing. Uh, none of these spells really give the weak Pythium Mage Core something to justify itself, which is what you're really kind of looking for. Um... Late Age Pythium just isn't impressive in that way. So what you're left with is, you're left with a nation that has really good Roman-style troops, has plenty of access to nature magic, but not a lot beyond that. Um, one thing that Pythium can do really well is Foul Vapors. And I've mentioned this before, Foul Vapors is a great battlefield clear. Absolutely trashes anybody without, nature, without uh, poison resistance. You can take a couple of Serpent Priests and drop Foul Vapors and Serpent's Blessing and all of your troops will be fine and happy. That requires a, a high level of research. Serpent's Blessing is Alteration... Uh, I'm losing my mind. It's either Alteration 6 or Alteration 7? Or is it... One second, I can look this up. I don't have to... I don't have to guess. Serpent's Blessing... Enchantment 7. Enchantment 7, I'm sorry, not Alteration 7, it's down Enchantment. You do want to go down Enchantment because you've got Death Magic, you could potentially get up to Death 2, have a Skull Staff to get to Death 3, summon a Mound Fiend, so you can get up to, you can get up to some Death Shenanigans. That's true, it's just random dependent, like everything else that Pythium does. Um, but yeah, you want to go down Enchantment anyway, so Serpent's Blessing, definitely something you want to grab. Um, and that will make your troops largely immune to your own Hydras if you decide to use Hydras. Uh, and it will make your troops immune to Foul Vapors, but the point just is, it comes pretty late in the game. This is another reason you want Magic 3 Scales, because you want to be able to research really, really fast to get down Enchantment and Alteration. Enchantment and Alteration are your primary paths, in my opinion, um, because Enchantment and Alteration give you your Nature and your Death spells, which is what you're going to be leaning on for most of the game. Um, your other paths are too low and or too rare and inconsistent to really make a huge amount of use of. You can get some fire with Heliodromai, um, you can get a little bit of water from your Renatas, but I wouldn't really count on doing a whole lot with them through most of the game. You can't get high level Earth. Uh, your Astral tops out at 2, I believe, because you don't have the, the Earth Astral cross path unless you manage to get Indies. Um, you do have a little bit of air from your Theurgs, but since, since they're capital only, you're a little bit limited in that. Uh, Alteration, once again, is the school for that, because what you mainly want is you mainly want to get Fog Warriors active to boost your really good infantry. And that, I think, is going to be strategically your main drive as Pythium, is spells to boost your infantry. So, Wooden Warriors, uh, Mass Protection, Mass Regeneration, Relief, Howl, uh, Fog Warriors... Twist Fate, or um, Cheat Fate, I'm sorry, is the, the ranged version of it. And uh, Will of the Fates. Uh, Body Ethereal. All those buff spells. What you want is to take your troops that are already really good at doing their job and make them better. Uh, unfortunately, you don't get much by way of damage buffs unless you can manage to get Earth into a communion somehow so that you can start dropping like Strength of Giants and stuff. Uh, you could potentially, if you research high-level blood, which I wouldn't say you should re waste time doing, but if you do, if you find Garnet Sorceresses or something, or you have some other reason to go deep into blood, you could potentially get Rush of Strength out with your Blood Random uh, Revelers. That might be one way to go, 
I think the cost is probably too high, though. So, overall, I think you're looking at mainly nature and astral buffs to your troops. Eventually, you'll also get Quickening, which will give your Renata something really useful to do, um, and Frozen Heart, which they can spam. So, there's options there, but I think most of your options mainly revolve around buffing your troops. Your troops are already the strongest part of the nation. If you can manage to get them a lot of support, then you'll make progress that way. Let's hop back in, look at Pretender Chassis real briefly. So, here's one unalloyed good thing about Pythium. They have access to a ton of Pretender God Chassis, um, including many of the best expanders and a lot of the best non-expanders as well. Um, as Pythium, you have access to the Divine Emperor. The Divine Emperor is a Dominion 2 Rainbow Chassis, so if you want a rainbow, the Divine Emperor is often a good choice. They have access to some of the better, immort the better Immobiles. Statue of Fertility is a really solid option. Um, the Statue of War or the Monument sometimes are, depending on what bless you want. And of course, they have some of the highest quality expanders. They have the Dracon. They have the Great White and Black Bulls. They have the Hound of Hades. They have the Myrmicoleon. They have the Man Eater. All so you can kind of pick your poison depending on what paths you want. Um, there's good arguments to be made in favor of lots of different chassis, and Late Age Pythium is one where I'm not going to give a real solid recommendation. Many nations have like a best choice or a couple of best choices. I think Pythium can work with a lot of different options. There is one thing I will say you kind of have to have. You have to have Production 3. There's no... Production 3 is vital to support the strongest portion of your nation, which is your infantry. They cost 26 resources each. You have to have high levels of production to churn them out. And unlike Ulm, which is the other nation that has really, really notably high resource infantry all the way across the board, you don't have smiths to help get them because you don't, you don't have resource bonus on anybody. So you can't mass mages up in your forts in order to gain those resources. You have to just get them the hard way. Um, this would also indicate why... On Late Age Pythium, I would say I would be tempted to spread my forts out just a little bit more than usual to try and collate enough resources in each one to be churning out several infantry per turn. Because otherwise, you can easily get into a situation where your fort can recruit a grand total of like three comitatenses every turn, and that's it. Um, ideally, you want to be pushing every fort up to at least a couple hundred resources so you can be getting, you know, 10 or 12 infantry out of each one. Um, I think the great uh, a bull would be a perfectly valid choice if you wanted even faster expansion. If you were to do this, I would barely take a bless. Like, something like this. A couple points of reinvigoration for your mages, um, possibly some poison resistance for your serpent cataphracts, or alternatively, uh, resilient low light vision, you know, some basic stuff there. You could potentially take unaging, um, but none of your mages are actually old because... Uh, almost all of your na mages have nature, and nature pushes up max age. Your theurgs don't, but your theurgs are not just regularly not old. Servant priests would be old, but they are nature too, and so their max age is actually 100 instead of 50 like normal. So, perfectly valid choice there. Um, you could take a monument and take a mage bless with like astral, you know, you could take like arcane finesse or far caster. That would be kind of cool. You could throw on some reinvigoration. If you want to use hydras, I would strongly, strongly recommend you either take Bark Skin or Hard Skin as blesses, because one of the big problems with Hydras is just that they take damage quickly enough to overwhelm their regeneration. You really need that extra protection in order to keep them on the field long enough for the regeneration to matter. Um, I, I wouldn't use Hydras still, but if you want to use Hydras, that's how. Um, other alternatives, yeah, they can't repel or anything because they're length zero weapons. Um, if you want to do something stupid but sort of hilarious, you could take Quick Hydras. That would be Oracle, or actually it would be Frostfather. Ten. You need to have Quickness. Um, and then you'll probably need to dump down to... Yeah, you'll need to do something like this, which is just really, really awful. Um, you can maybe go a Point of Turmoil or two... Um, you really hate losing recruitment points because your Comitatensis cost a bunch of recruitment points too. But if you really wanted to meme, you could do this. And if you did this, then your Hydras... <laughs> then, then your Hydras do have 10 attacks. So keep that in mind. 
That might be worth considering. Who am I kidding? That's not worth considering. Don't consider that. Um, but if you wanna, if you want to, uh, if you're interested in zoom snakes, that is the zoom snake build. That's so silly. Don't do that, kids. Um, you could take a virtue. Now, virtues used to not be very efficient. I've been looking at them more lately. Honestly, you can expand with a virtue. And the reason you can expand with a virtue is that they have immort they have not immortality. I'm losing my mind again. They have invulnerability 25. So they effectively have 25 protection against anybody you're expanding into, except for mages. And they have five points of awe, so they don't get attacked much. So that being so, if you pick your battles with a virtue, um, you can actually expand, you, you can aid your expansion significantly with one. Just by, well, virtue of, I mean, even with almost no bless, you know, a virtue can zip around picking their battles. And that's important for a, for a, a, a not a super combatant exactly, but for a pretender god in general. Um, it's not going to give you great scales. But these are okay scales for Pith. I mean, you are significantly positive at this point. Like, this is plus two scales and six Dominion. You could cut the Dominion down to five. That would give you an extra scale. Probably knock that up. I don't like going Misfortune 3 anymore. I used to kind of like going Misfortune 3, but nowadays, meh, not so much. Too many, too many awful events. Um, this gives you Air 2, so this Virtue can cast Mist Form on themselves. Um, you don't really have the points to get any other magic at all, but at least they can do that, and they will be able to expand into most independent provinces without much trouble. Now, of course, Virtues only have 39 hit points, so if something goes wrong, something is going to go wrong in a big hurry, uh, and you're going to suffer a lot. But, with a little bit of luck, a Virtue can take... 8 or 9 or 10 extra provinces in year 1, or year 0 rather, and turn your expansion from good into ridiculous. So that might be one way to go for it. Uh, other alternatives, I mean, any of these, any of these four are fine. This guy's fine, this guy's fine, this guy can be fine if you take the right bless for him. It's a pretty heavy bless though. Um, you could take the gray ones as an awake researching trinity and jack your research points up through the roof. That's perfectly valid. Um, probably wouldn't take any of the titans. None of these are really good titans. Um, you could, if you want to meme, there's the uh, there's the infamous uh, asshole Batman strategy where you take the Titan of the Underworld, who is an assassin and invisible, and uh, go park him on an enemy capital and just methodically assassinate the mage he recruits every turn. <laughs> if you want to be a complete jerk, that's a way to do it for sure. Because since he's invisible, um, patrolling units don't count unless they have spirit sight. <laughs> And uh, anyone without Spirit Sight gets minus 10 to hit him. So the Titan of the Underworld is hilariously hard to find. Um, but I wouldn't bother. I would just either take an Immobile or take one of the high quality expanders. Or maybe the gray ones for research. Late Age Pythium can go a lot of ways. And I guess that's kind of my, my point and my issue with them actually is Late Age Pythium can go a lot of different ways. But none of those different ways are actually very good. Um, if you look carefully at what Pythium brings to the table, none of it is very special. None of it is very strong. None of it is anything that some other nation doesn't already do a little bit better. Um, and that's kind of my beef with them, and that's why I would put them as a weak nation, because all of Pythium's tricks have been seen before. Everyone is going to be ready for the things you can do. You can do nature, you can to an extent do death. You can do death with, with Renatus, that's okay, you can do death. You can do water, I guess, but everybody can do water. Um, you're, you have Astral, but it's quite limited and over and difficult to handle because there's so many randoms involved. Um, you have a tiny bit of fire, you have a tiny, tiny bit of blood, but it's, it's really so little that it's almost a trap option. Um, I don't know. I just... Eh, they're not very... They're not great. They're not great, guys. Um, your best strategies, like I say, I think are going to be taking a lot of scales, expanding with your really good troops, and then trying to transition as quick and as hard as you can into 
small communions or individual mages with boosters buffing troops from behind the lines. Uh, summon Lars, because Lars are really good value for the gems. And just uh, when you're heading into the mid game, the question is going to be how do I move from my troop heavy, buff heavy early mid game into the late mid game where high level magic dominates? And to be honest, I don't have a good answer for that. And that's kind of where Pythium, in my opinion, falls apart. Is that that like turn 35 40 transition is very, very rough for Pythium because the really good stats of your Comitatenses stop mattering so much. And what starts mattering is how powerful your mages are. And Pythium doesn't really have a good, uh, a good entry into the top mages list. So, in any case, thanks for watching. By all means, talk about this one because I'm like I said I'm actually a little bit confused about how to play late age pythium myself I think that's come across here and I'd love to hear your input so thanks all for watching leave comments down below talk about this nation let's see if we can kind of work out a little bit of a way to to strategize about how to get over that turn 35 turn 40 hump and make some progress in the late game thank you all once again I'll see you in the next video